Okay, we've got a couple things to do today. Um, we need to, to get ready for the next week's lab. We're gonna be looking at an introduction to the vascular plants, which I kind of think about as an introduction to life on the land, although the bryophytes, obviously they're living on the land, and so are the fungi. But both the bryophytes and the fungi live in very moist environments, and they take advantage of that fact to, in the different parts of their life cycle. For instance, in the, in the mosses, Okay, so the mosses take, a, take advantage of the, the water in their life, in their reproduction. And you'll see that displayed very nicely in the video that we show in lab, which will illustrate the fertilization process in mosses. In the vascular plants now, we have, as we go kind of up the evolutionary ladder, so to speak, it's not quite, that's not quite a right, correct statement here, but we want to say increase the level of complexity as we go up in our classification system, we're going to see that the plants become increasingly less dependent upon water. So they become more and more adapted to this life on, in this very desiccating, dry environment. Even a humid day, even a rainy day on the land is nothing compared to life in the ocean, compared to how much water you're surrounded by. So and these plants have to get used to this kind of very difficult life on the land. So that's what we want to talk about when we say introduction to the vascular plants. We want to talk about this life on the land, life on the land. And here they are in our phylogeny, the vascular plants. Here's the mosses we did last time. It's the, that's called the sister group, and you can see it just means it's the next branch over on the phylogeny here. The characteristics that typify or that characterize this group of vascular plants, the presence of lignin, xylem, and phloem, especially, but to some extent also the branch sporophyte and the independent sporophyte have to do with this adaptation to the life on the land. So let's just go up those very quickly. The independent sporophyte, remember that in the mosses we found the sporophyte was growing out of the gametophyte. So the gametophyte grew in those moist areas. The sporophyte was a little drier, but it grew out of the moist gametophyte and took its nutrition and water from that. Now we're gonna see the sporophyte is independent. The sporophyte is, if you go out and you look at a pine tree, that's a sporophyte. A flowering plant, that's all of a sporophyte. You don't see the gametophytes on those. We'll talk about where the gametophytes are later. They're hidden. They're hidden in those plants. So the independent sporophyte characterizes all these vascular plants. The sporophyte's gonna be branched. Again, think of a pine tree. Think of a pea plant. These are very large sporophytes. They have elaborate structures. They're just saying that here, branch. Some of them are small and just mild, mildly branched, but some of them are very elaborate. The lignin, the lignin and the xylem and phloem. Well, let's do xylem and phloem, our, our transport. And the lignin it does a lot of things. A lignin is the compound. In the xylem, in the, let's say, make it precise, in the xylem cell walls and in the walls of other cells. I don't have room to write that, but so it's in the wall, it's in specialized cell wall in there. And it resists, it resists degradation. So when we looked out at those big logs outside and said that almost nothing can decay these logs except fungi, it's the lignin in there that's preventing that decay. The lignin is very, um, resistant to decay. It also gives strength to the walls. So it strengthens the walls and it's gonna help them stand, help these plants stand upright. So we've got transport tissues and one of those, the xylem, is strengthened by this lignin in it. We'll look at that again. These are all characteristics that typify and are uniquely derived characteristics <laughs> of the land plants. So the challenges of life on the land. We've already talked about desiccation. They tend to dry out very easily. Transport, I've referred to with the xylem and phloem, but just think of a, even a relatively large aquatic alga like chara, surrounded by water. It can depend on the water to take nutrients to all parts of the plant. Only when you get really big like things like the kelps, 
then there is, in those cases, there is mechanisms of internal transport. We just haven't gone into those in detail in this class. But if you took a psychology class, which unfortunately we don't offer here, you would study the transport systems in those things like the brown algae. So there are exceptions that algae don't have transport systems. But on the whole, the algae depend upon the medium in which they are immersed for transport. <coughs> and finally, support is the third one. And we've alluded to that a little bit by talking about the ligand. But it is not a trivial thing to stand up in the air against this gravity. Organisms have to have mechanisms that allow them to do that. And there are a whole number slew of mechanisms that are very interesting of how they do that. Of course, in biomechanics, we go into a lot of that more. Unfortunately, we don't have a course in biomechanics here, and this is not one. But we will talk very briefly about, very, very briefly about support in the plants. But I recommend that to you. If you're ever interested sometime, look up uh, the studies of biomechanics, especially if you have interest in math and biology. It's a fantastic and a very interesting area. So let's first of all talk about desiccation. Immersed in water, you don't have to worry about it. You don't lose water, it comes right back in from the outside. In fact, the problem is quite the opposite in water, of course, because there are solutes dissolved inside the cell, and water is continually flowing into the cell, so it's really the opposite problem of desiccation. You've got to prevent yourself from bursting. And we talked about the role of the contractile vacuoles very early on in things like climbing ammonia, continually pumping water out of the cells. So organ some organisms have even active transport mechanisms to deal with that problem in aquatic organisms. In the land, we're in a very dry environment, and desiccation is the problem. So what do they do? Well, essentially, the evolutionary adaptation for adaptation is, for desiccation, is to cover the plant in a waxy coating. <coughs> so just imagine if you, know, you took and you covered yourself in paraffin, you covered all your sweat glands and things, you would not lose very much water through sweating. Now, you'd also die for other reasons, but we just leave that aside for the moment. But you got the point that you, if you just used a waxy coating completely covering the organism, you could prevent desiccation. And then the internal part of the organism is separated from the external part. So that's what, the, that's what plants do. They have a covering called a little skin. Of course, we have to do that in Greek. That's ICLE, and that's the diminutive ending, ICLE. So a little skin. And that skin I'm going to put in, ink, in yellow here, and here it is. It covers this whole surface of the plant. So here it is on the epidermis again. There's a waxy covering that covers that, and it prevents water loss. Now that's a problem, like I say, if you did that to your skin, you would die, and if you did this completely to the plant, the plant would die, because we need the gases from the air, the carbon dioxide for respiration, sorry, the oxygen needs to come in for respiration, the carbon dioxide needs to be ex excluded from the plant. So. There has to be ways that gas exchange can take place. And this is through, whoops, I don't need the highlighter. I want the <coughs> pen. This is through small little holes in the plant. And these holes are called mouths. So there is a little mouth. And let's get a better for that and get a different color. There is a little mouth there, and we'll do that in Greek. That is a stoma. And so those stoma, the stoma are the openings, or we say plural. Stomata. Plural. That's a PL. So the stomata then are holes in the surface of the plant. 
Now, there's an interesting fact about evaporation, about the physics of evaporation. Let's say that you took a open dish of water and you just left that and, and measured how much evaporation was gonna come from that. And then you took another dish and you put it next to it and you covered that with, let's say, saran wrap. And you let the saran wrap less, sit right on the surface of the water. Now you punch little tiny, really tiny holes in that saran wrap. Which dish would you get more evaporation from? It's the saran wrap dish. Now it's counterintuitive and, I'm, and I don't have time to go into the physics of it, but there isn't, you can do that experiment and you get more evaporation from the saran wrap one. Now you've got to space those little tiny holes right to do that, but you can actually get that. So we've got a problem here. Now we put these little holes in the thing and, we, and they're spaced in such a way we actually get very good evaporation. Whoa, we just screwed up our whole idea here, our whole mechanical idea of preventing water loss because now we've got great evaporation. So how do we, how is that solved? It's solved by closing the stomata, closing the mouths at certain points of time with guard cells. And here are the guard cells. On the left, the guard cells are closed. And over here, they are open. So these guard cells can close and open through a process of moving water in and out. And again, we just don't have time to go into all these details. I only, I think you did some of this in introductory biology. I just refer you to your um, textbook if you want to know more about how this works. It's all detailed very nicely in the textbook. But the prop point I am making is the guard cells will swell or, or um, become less turgid, collapse, and that will open and close the stomata. And so it lets the plant then regulate water loss through it. So really, they are, it's a very interesting kind of, of situation. So now what do we have here? We have, um, I just wanted to point this out because I saw, you saw that big thing here and these big things over here. And I should really do it in another color because they have nothing to do with what we're saying at the moment. These are secretory glands. So there are actually glands that occur in the plant that secrete substances of importance in the life of the plant. For instance, if you take a mint leaf or a lavender leaf or any of those plants and you crush it, you notice it has a very pungent aroma. Those kinds of things come from those glands. In fact, that's almost certainly the leaf of one of those plants like lavender or mint because that, those plants have typical glands that look like those two types of glands. So just for reference at some other time. Here's our stoma. Here's, that's open. There's the stoma down there. That's closed. Two different views of the guard cell. There are the guard cells that regulate the opening and closing of the stoma. And then there are these other cells next to the guard cells, these really big cells here. They're called subsidiary cells. They function along with the guard cells to open and close them. Again, more than we can do today to talk about how that works. But it's all an apparatus for regulating water loss through the plant. Transport. The main tissues for transport, as we've said, are the xylem and the phloem. Xylem means wood in Greek, and the xylem then is the major component of the wood. So that when you go out and you cut into a plant and you cut into the wood, you are cutting into the xylem. You are cutting into the transport tissue 
for water. So this is the water transport. Phloem means bark. It's an unfortunate term because the phloem is not really the bark. And I'm just going to have to leave that aside for now, the root word aside. I'll just tell you the root word means bark. It's not a root word you're going to see on an exam. Maybe when we get to the angiosperms, we can talk about <coughs> how the bark is structured and why that term is a little, why that Greek word is a little misleading. It means bark and it is sugar transport. So these tissues are analogous to the hydroids and the leptoids of the mosses, similar to the hydroids and leptoids of the mosses. But they have very different structures, and they probably, certainly, they evolved independently. I said probably, but I, I'm certain they evolved independently. So here are the different structures in different versions of uh, different kinds of sections. Here are some vessels. I suppose I really should have done these in different colors. I'm going to, there are some vessels. Those are xylem, parts of the xylem. I'm going to use red for xylem from now on here. Here are more xylem. Here's more xylem. This whole thing, that's another part of the xylem. You can see it's very big. These holes for the transport of water are very big in some plants compared to other parts of the plant. In some kind, in some cases, they are, they are smaller, like this. But again, these are still vessels, or this is still, let's just label it xylem. And now let me find another color for phloem. What color is going to work? Let me try that. It looks orange up here. The phloem is much harder to find. Here are some areas of phloem. This is phloem. So that is a cell of the phloem, just like this over here. This is a cell of the xylem. You can see that both the xylem and the phloem consist of units, and those units are stacked up to form tubes through the plant. Now, those tubes function in very different ways. <clears throat> and then in the other pictures, it's very difficult to find the phloem. But I would say here, this is phloem. And I'm not even going to, no, here, this is flown. And I am not going to ask you, based on that, to pick out xylem and phloem in sections. It's, of course, in plant anatomy, would teach you to do that. But it would take a few labs for you to get good enough to see those different things. So don't have any anxiety that I'm going to ask you those things. The basic idea here is that we've got specialized transport tissues, xylem and phloem. Xylem transports water, phloem transports sugars. And then one more point, the transport of xylem is unidirectional. We only, only water, transport, water is only transported upwards from the roots up to the leaves in the xylem. And that's because the xylem is dead when it functions. So these cells of the xylem are dead. Unidirectional transport. Flow them. Bidirectional transport. And the cells are living, but they are really weird. They're almost as weird as fungi. So these cells that transport the sugars have no nucleus, they have no, um, they have no organelles. There is cytoplasmic continuity between the cells, special kinds of cytoplasmic 
continuity occurs between the cells in the tube, and all of the metabolism that is for these cells, all the metabolism that these cells need takes place over here on the other side through this little companion cell here. And you may have talked about some of those things in introductory biology. So again, the important things here are xylem dead at maturity, unidirectional transport, phloem living at maturity, bidirectional transport. Those are the things that I really want you to remember. Support. You saw that those cells of the xylem had thick walls. Xylem means wood, and so the wood is a supportive tissue in addition to being a transportive tissue. But now, the wood is a supportive tissue not just because it contains these elements of xylem and phloem, of xylem, sorry, just of xylem. It's also got other cells in it. So we would say that a xylem is a, a complex tissue. It's got all kinds of different cells in it. No phloem, but all kinds of different cells. <clears throat> Those other types of cells, the ones I want to mention right now, are very thick-walled cells. I call them thick-walled support cells. And you can see how that wall here of this cell, this is all cell wall, never find a cell except in these kind of cells that this thick, here's one even thicker. This is the cell wall, that really thick cell walls. Incredibly thick. These cells, and the ones we're looking at there, have all kinds of different shapes. The most common kind of shape is elongated like this. And that's very likely the cells that we're looking at, they're in cross section elongated and they have very thick walls. And the center of the cell, whoa, I lost my coloring. The center of the cell called the lumen is very narrow, much more narrow than I've drawn it there. These are called fibers. And then there are other kinds of these same cells and they've got all kinds of specialized names, and we're not going to learn those. You may applaud. No? So other shapes of support cells. So, you know, an astrosclera, a star shape. Sclera, a star shape support cell. Some of these cells you know from tooth experience. If you've eaten a pear, I've always wondered what those little grindy things in pears are. They, are. they are these cells. They have very thick walls on them. So the pears are infused with these cells. And if you eat a wild pear, they've got even more of those. They are herbivore defenses. Pro almost certainly they're herbivore defenses. So a beetle comes along and chews on it, and it gets its mandibles abraded and a little bit ripped apart because these cells are so hard. Now there is a name for these types of support cells that is, that, and that name is um, general to all the specialized types. And we do need to know that name. And this, that name means that there has been an infusion of hardness throughout the plant. So the general name for these support, support cells is sclerenchyma. And did we do this term already? I've got this vague memory. No. Must have been last semester. Sclera hard and enchyma and infusion. So an infusion of hardness through the cells. And it's one way they're supported. Now there is another way that this, these the organisms are supported. There is another process in plants that is called a hygroskeleton. And I don't think I've got a blank screen here. I do not. I will use the board. It is used not just by plants, but by many other kinds of organisms, earthworms, the major motion of earthworms, snakes, all these 
organisms that some of them with backbones, but you know they have this uh, a lot of other structures around the backbones that are uh, holding together. Even the fact that <clears throat> this is very appropriate for this time. Even the fact that my flesh does not rip off my hands when I go like when my arm when I go like this, despite the time of year, has partially to do with the fact that there is a high, we have hydroskeletons as part of our support systems. Plants have them more. So what is a hydroskeleton? It consists of two, two parts, a, and let me look at my notes so I write the most clear word I can. An elastic outer covering. And an incompressible fluid. enclosed in that covering. And that's exactly what a balloon is. There is the elastic covering, the outer skin of the balloon. Now, air is pretty compressible, but it's not completely compressible. Just imagine you did that with water, right? Water would be very incompressible, and that's in fact how plants are going to do it. So think of this. Now, if I had some other balloons here that were spherical, or you know the typical kind of party balloons instead of these magician balloons, we could do that same thing. We could take those little balloons and think of each one as a cell with the outer membrane there being the cell wall. And you know that the cells through osmosis are continually taking in water so that they have an uh, elastic outer covering. The cell wall expands a little bit. Elastic outer covering, let me say that that resists, that elastic covering, it resists That's what I mean by elastic here. So it's going, to, it's going to expand a little bit, but it's going to resist that expansion. And so it's going to press back on that fluid. So back to our balloons. Our, we have our spherical balloons. They are like little individual cells. We now stick them all together. Imagine we make a little, a little balloon mound. And we take some tape and wrap it around them. That is an essence of what a plant is. It has all these individual cells in it, and it can stand up against gravity. I encourage you to go do that at home. Get some balloons and make a little, you make a little balloon tower. You make it like that. You can make a little, I mean, you can make it quite tall. That by having, having no internal support at all except the balloons and then a little tape on the outside. So that is, this is also why when you don't water your plants, they go over because those individual cells lose their turgidity and they can no longer maintain that hydros hydroskeleton. The elastic outer covering is there, but the fluid that you need on the inside has gone away when they wilt. That is a very quick and I know in complete, I hope somewhat comprehensible introduction to a fascinating part of study, again, part of biomechanics and how plants start up, stay up with a hydro, hydroskeleton. And so all herbaceous plants use that. If they, have, don't, if they have very little wood, they are using that hydroskeleton to stand up.